Um, welcome everyone. Hi, it's Nina Collins and we're here on the Wolfer and I'm super excited today to be in conversation with one of my heroes, Sandra Singh Lowe, who's talking to us from California. Um, yeah, we were just saying before we got on that the, I was reading in Publishers Weekly yesterday that it is kind of an amazing moment for people who plan events because you can kind of get anyone because everyone's just at home, right? <laughs> so has that been good? You've been doing more events than originally planned or at least- Yeah, I mean, first, I mean, we, we've all gone through the stages of the pandemic of the first when it was, I think it was March, Friday, March 13th that the national emergency was declared. I was going- June 2nd, I'm sure I'll be fine. And that as we all have lived through his death by a thousand small cuts and you know, seeing bookstores close. And, and, but then it sort of starts growing back in a different way. And yeah. um, I have to say one of the things since you asked, but like is I've been doing, cause I can't do in bookstore events. So I do COVID safe curbside pickup of autographed books out of my garage on Saturday okay. afternoons. It's actually been really fun. That's actually really cool. So you get fans like driving up. Yeah, and they and they actually drive from really long. Just, but the good thing about it is, if you go to a bookstore, you kind of like, like it's kind of like we we can't have many people due to COVID, so it slows everything down. So if somebody drives from sixty miles away to come up and get one book, then we kind of chat for fifteen to twenty minutes. I have refreshments. It's really visiting in a way that I've never visited. That is actually super sweet. So to back up everyone, we're here to promote and talk about Sandra's new book, which is called The Mad Woman and the Roomba. And it was just published by Norton on June 2nd. And I think I first discovered you really, let's see, if I'm 50 now, you're like a little older than I am. You're 58. like 58. So probably I was, when, when did you start writing those super funny pieces in the Atlantic? I feel like I was in my late thirties. Was it that long ago? Yeah, it was, it was really a long time where I look back. I mean, time just kind of uh, accordions in and out. I think it was probably the 2000, around 2004 or something like that. Oh my God, yeah. 16 years ago. Like 16 years ago. And she was, you really should look them up listeners. If you've never, I mean, she just, everything she writes is super smart and funny. Um, but she started writing these pieces about aging in the Atlantic. Atlantic that like had me on the floor and then she published a book called um the mad woman in the volvo which i think was it was a notable book of 2014 it did incredible yes well. no no it was like one of the best a hundred a hundred notable books of nonfiction in the new york times so yeah it really yeah. is and in my mind it was kind Kind of one of the early the earliest and certainly the best book on menopause I mean and maybe it was where I was in my life like I was really ready to start I've always been precocious in that way I always wanted to like read about the next stage a lot before it happened yes mm -hmm. and uh it's just a great book so and you also do acting you've had a one-woman show you do things for NPR you really kind of do you're all over the place in in all of your writing and talking are you still acting uh, let's see. I just did my, okay. So yeah, it's always uh, in that. I just did my Christmas show, Sugar Plum Fairy at East West Players in December, 2019. One of the last shows to be up before March came down. So that's an annual Christmas show that I do with two other actors. And it's, it's about the Nutcracker and it's, it's you know, I, I get to do the monologue part and then they get to do a lot of the dance part, which is really great. So, you know, and, and since I, I kind of was a late bloomer anyway, sort of like by the time I started doing monologues at, I was 34 and went to the Aspen uh, Humor Comedy Festival and they go, say you're 31. So I never, I, I never was a young breakout. I was like late bloomer, late, late, late. So, so I, you know, yeah, everything is always in motion. Everything is always in motion. But how did you, so you went from writing to also wanting to perform. You always kind of wanted to perform and did you always see yourself as, cause you're, you're a humor writer, but also not cause you're super, um, I mean, some of your writing about your father, for example, I think of as just being extremely poignant. It's a little bit David Sedaris like, um, and you know, you write about your teenage daughters and you write about your divorce and your relationship now, and you write about, drinking during quarantine, but everything has a kind of a depth to it, really. Well, I, I think there was no career path for me when I came up. It was like the 70s and 80s. I began wanting to be a playwright because mm -hmm. I loved writing plays and then having people show up on stage and do it. 
But in LA at that time, holding a cast of actors together was tricky because they all were just going out for pilot season and whatever. And that some of them were so unreliable and, and it, it can be expensive that you go, okay, if I show up, I know I can do the monologue and, and I know that I'll be there. You and I actually began as a composer and a pianist. So I would do, you know, what I call piano logs, but my compositions were too complicated for people to understand. So I would say, well, this would be kind of like the beginning of a movie about the future where it was kind of like, and I'd start to describe the music and then that became monologues. And then I met Ira Glass over the phone before there even was a This American Life. It was called Your Radio Playhouse. Um, so it all, it was around the eighties and nineties it sort of there it was kind of seamless that sometimes you write in a magazine and then it becomes a commentary those commentaries become a book that book may become a solo show so i've always had this kind of mm, yeah, it right cross platform thing going and some some of it lends itself better to certain things and some others some are 2 minute right now i'm doing the lowdown on science which is 90 seconds a day of science and we just got on google news so it's kind of if you say siri I think that's who it is. Like, like people are doing that that because I'm a science background. So it's really eclectic and has no has no form. Has no much form. Like my, much like my midriff right now. <laughs> but it sounds kind of awesome. Wait, what is this lowdown on science? Tell us. More so the lowdown on science because I actually got my BS and I did put the BS in physics from Caltech in 1983. So I began because my father's Chinese as a scientist. So I've been doing these science commentaries for about 16 years daily. And so that's going, that's my stock and trade. Wow. So, I didn't even know this. You do it on the radio or where do you do it? Yeah, yeah. It's on, on KPCC 89.3 FM in Los Angeles. It's also syndicated and now it's on Google News. How cool. And how do you come up with the subjects? And how long is it? How long do you talk? Uh, it's, it's 90 seconds. So it's super short. It's kind of like your, your minute a day of science. The whole drive of it is like science literacy in America which is rather important now, as we've seen. Um, so, and, and they always wanted it to be funny and witty. I mean, so it's informative, but witty. And I have a team of UC Irvine science grad students who write them and we call them the hive. I'm the queen bee of the hive. So they do, they, so they read cool. it and they do it and they do, I mean, they're, they're really amazing and they do it and I simply narrate. Wow, I love that. Actually, someone in our community just posted on the Wolfer app and said, yes, I love the science commentary. So everyone knew about this but me. So that's really great. How did this book come about? I mean, it's, it's a clear follow-up, right? Um, yeah. And it's written, how many years later? Six years later. Yeah. And how do you see your life different from then to this, from that book to this book? Well, I mean, The Mad Woman and the Volvo, as we talked about, and you mentioned it as a men, I think, I think it's, I like it as a menopause book because just to go back to the Mad Woman and the Volvo, like I say, usually when you go, oh, what's menopause? You go to the, what used to be the women's health corner of the bookstore behind the Dr. Phil cutout, and it would be written by a nurse or a doctor, you know, just saying, uh, okay, and it always has a flower on the cover. So it's like, say, a rose or a, a, a daisy or something, which makes no sense. It should be a Medusa head screaming. So, <laughs> and the only advice is, well, cut out alcohol, sugar, and caffeine. Exactly. Get more you know, which is our three food water. group. Right. And then do a lot of breathing and yoga and meditation and oh, no coffee either. Yeah, it's kind of like it, it is so unhelpful. Yeah. It's, it's like, like that, 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 also, that's the same advice you get when you're pregnant. So how does that work? You get for everything. It's like we know that if we sleep more, drink more water, don't drink alcohol, <laughs> exercise all the time. We'll anyway, like how could that make sense? When I was pregnant, I had lots of eggs. Now I don't have any eggs. And you're giving me the same advice, which is like calm down and hydrate. So, you know, and I, I they sh should say, you know, and forgive me, you just kind of like uh, run off to Las Vegas and have an affair with a sailor or something like that <laughs> and smoke and have tequila and blow your head off because you are going through something that that's it's that major. Right. And so my I'm using this book, glass, by the way, I'm drinking iced tea. I'll drink wine later, but I'm used yes. drinking from your mad woman in the Volvo glass, which is super funny to listeners on the other yes, side. It is watching. here. The mad it, woman, the Volvo glass. And it, yeah, it, it's hard to, it's impossible to see, but, all right, it's impossible to see, but there's a level that says Dr. Oz recommends. Yes. Level. 
And then yes. there's a the weight watchers yeah. level, and then there's the mad woman level, just quite. Yeah, you, sorry to see it. Yeah, so the Dr. Oz is the bottom, Weight Watchers is the second one, mad woman is full to the top. And that, yeah, that sometimes you have to do this because you're going through such a major change. So the mad woman of the vulva was just a personal story about a woman blowing up and like going, I was, it happened to me, I was driving on the freeway one day and all those little tent poles that hold our days together, like, I'm going to go to Starbucks and get that venti, unsweetened, passion fruit tea with four splendas and then I'm going to put on my NPR show the calm one and then this and that I was driving in in you know in, in my car in the afternoon and thinking that night that I had promised my kids that we would do make your own pizza which is like I say this horrible thing that m m creative mothers have invented for their creative children we can't just order a pizza we have to make it, make it. and we all that horrible rolly dough sticky dough that you get from Trader Joe's and, and I just started like falling apart so that's what that means so that book is about a woman falling apart and um and, and, and how, making it through that particular year. And of course, of course burning a man and having an affair. Um, but then this, this book is a couple of years later, um, I, I actually turned it in two years late because they really wanted a, not like a domestic comedy, but humor, Nina. It's called humor. And it's really kind of a little bit hard to find these days of, of just, he, like, can we have in the middle of all the things that are happening that, that are so serious and so tragic and so global, it's kind of like, can you have a moment in your day? And you can see my living room, what it actually looks like. And there's I'd my love massage being chair. able to see your living room. And I'm going to, we're going to talk about that massage chair in a minute, but your living yeah, room. So, so how how do you, I how think do you, you, sorry to interrupt but I think of you in a craftsman house. I mean, I've really read so much of what you've written, probably everything you've written. So it's really fun just for me to see the little craftsman details in the background. Yes, and the books, you see the books by the stairs because we don't have to actually have bookshelves. Those <laughs> are the guitars, why it's like, yeah, there is a, and I, there were bills on that thing, but I threw a blanket over that and then that. <laughs> so so it, yeah, it, it's just how we actually live, not how we represent ourselves on Facebook sometimes where all the children are amazing and they're all graduate, like it's kind of like, well, it's just kind of like they're wires be, that you can see everywhere. So that, that was the follow up. So the Mad Woman in the Room was so, supposed to be the comedic follow up book, but then the 2016 election happened. And mm -hmm. I, and part of the journey of being women, like uh, again, I'm 58, so I'm, I'm a very late boomer or a slightly too old to be Gen Xer. Mm -hmm. So I call myself kind of, I have baby boom tastes on a Gen X budget mm -hmm. or first world guilt on a third world budget of always being between a couple of places. Cause there's been so much change in the last 50 years um, that, you know, when women went into the workplace, they were supposed to humanize the workplace. When men went home, it was supposed to humanize the men. But instead of working 40 hours a week, men work 50, women work 60. And now we spend more time parenting our children than did, you know, full-time stay-at-home moms of the 50s so right. women have had to wear all these new hats and then oh my gosh and i'm looking at my my uh, hadassah arm as we leave to go it's like and if i don't go to the farmer's market uh, to buy an organically locally sourced uh, dinner for my family mcdonald's wins so women have a lot of stresses on them in terms of trying to hold this all together so to me the mad woman in the roomba which is like was trying seeing one woman in just a year in the life of the things that she's trying to hold together in a year when, you know, uh, this particular year where somebody like Ariana Huffington, this is how ridiculous it is, Nina. Someone like Ariana Huffington has suddenly discovered this new sleep. thing called sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so she's gonna tell us about sleep. I go, my family sleeps like rock stars. That's not our problem, uh, you know, sleeping, which is to have to sleep and then get up and give a TED talk. That's, that's the awful part, but it's really an absurd time. So to, so the end of your question, I know it's a really long that's rambling great. answer, was it was supposed to be a year in a life. And at, at this, so it's ironic that it came out in the pandemic because I had, you know, pussy hat knitting hat parties and the women's march there because it was really that year. And my editor, Jill Bielowski at Norton, my publisher, she said, you know what? I think by the time this book comes out, we're going to be in such a different time. So take it out. And it is, she was right. Little, little, did we know, little did we know what a different time, but yeah. 
Right, but the, but the opening still kind of holds. It goes, it goes kind of, and we know the world is a crazy place and it's so surreal and of which so many words have been written. This book is about pull up your massage chair, pull out your glass, and let's just have a laugh about our daily life. So in a way it still fits, but we had no idea. No, I think in a lot of ways it really still fits, particularly because, you know, it's my year of domestic mayhem. We've never had a period before we've been so domestic, right? The last three months, we're literally at home. I mean, I use my Roomba every day and the picture on the cover of, um, you know, the French toast burning in flames. I mean, we're all- It's, it's an ego, it's an ego, but yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, we're with our children and for a lot of us who have older children, we didn't expect, like I, you know, my kids were out in the world. They were all kind of, they just, two of them just graduated from college. So I never thought that I'd have all my kids back at home at one time for months on end. Um, and here they are. And, you know, so this idea of like, and even, you know, you talk in the book, you joke a lot about drinking, which is funny because I too have been, this is not dry January for me during, uh, <laughs> during COVID. Um, and, you know, these are just real, the realities of being at home and dealing with all the stuff we're dealing with is exhausting and overwhelming. And for women our age, you know, we're dealing with menopause. A lot of us are dealing with the sandwich generation. I, you know, sometimes I almost feel the fortunate that I don't have living parents I'm taking care of because on top of everything else I just don't even know how I'd manage um so I think a lot of women will relate to this book and relate to your stories and it's just so good to be able to laugh a little yeah no I, I appreciate that yes and, and while you're home we had murder hornets for a moment and West Nile carrying mosquitoes so the pat yeah it's sort of the problems in the book of our pest control issues are amplified and I think also the notion of midlife relationships that I had heard during the quarantine. So I had quarantined with my partner. So, you know, male partner, we're you know, kind of like, we're middle-aged people and my, and just how people start to drive each other nuts. Like there's a, a supposedly something that has come up in the quor pandemic quarantine where your partner, the sounds of them chewing seem really amplified. Yeah, that is definitely a thing. In fact, we were <laughs> dinner the other night with my boyfriend and my kids, and one of the kids started talking about how the sound of everyone chewing was making her crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that is a thing. And I wanted to go back to something you said before that was funny about Facebook pictures, because this morning my 26-year-old wrote to me and asked if I had any baby pictures handy, because at her job, which is on Zoom now, they're doing a baby picture show and tell. So it's like a work you know, one of these getting to know everyone better, support everyone better at work things. So I started looking through Facebook for old pictures and I saw all these pictures of my kids over the years on Facebook where everyone looks so beautiful and so happy and I'm scrolling and scrolling and I'm like, wow, you know, they have had a good life. We have had a good life. Things aren't really so bad. You know, it was funny that the Facebook reality and kind of the real life reality coming together. Oh, anyway. Really? Um, you have a quote in your book where you quote from, what is it, The Last Marigold Hotel? Or maybe it's in an email you sent me, but you said, all will be well in the end. If it's not well, it's not the end. Yeah. I love yeah. that. It's so funny. It's so yeah. true. Those movies, it's, of course, I've been addicted to. Um, yeah, I just the comfort viewing. It's like Last Marigold Hotel. Like I said, the British baking show is too stressful because the fondants are rolling. So when a snuggles bear TV. And, and I think the Marigold Hotels have really, if, if there are only two of them. But there are only two of them, but they have some wisdom in them. Yeah. So curiously, like on a more serious level, dealing with all of, having a book come out, during the pandemic and then of course all these protests how, how is that super hard are you having to like change your message a little bit are you doing stuff in particular in relation to black lives matter like how are you feeling about all this are you trying to say like let's let's have a little respite from the drama of the day here I think, you know, and I was just having a, a, a conversation with my 19 year old daughter about this you know because um First of all, I think intergenerationally, um, there's a lot. There's a lot of different lenses that people are looking at this through in terms of this just very traumatic, tragic situation. Um, so, I, and I think that it is. It just feels really heightened right now, particularly within family. You know, I, let, let's say you know your family. You've been quarantining. Some people are sixty and older, so they really shouldn't go out. The young people have been cooped up 
and they feel things so passionately because they're on certain kinds of social media and they they grew up in a different time than we did i mean just to lens back for a moment when i was thinking about my other book where it okay and I, this is kind of stepping back but i'll step but it's like, so I'm 58 and I was an old mom. So I had kids at 38 and 40. Mm -hmm. And so when Hillary Clinton, just to go back, mm -hmm. lost the election, I was so traumatized. It, it's just like, we're, it's like, no, you don't know what we've been through and how important this was for us. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like, as women, uh, phone calling, how, you, you do not, you don't get how personal this is of this story. And my kids just didn't see it all. It's like, they're Bernie Sanders. You know why? <laughs> like, because Hillary Clinton was against gay rights. Like, and it's like, oh no, Bernie's like, so there was that. But then I realized my youngest kid in particular, who was born in 2002, had never not had a black president. Right, just right. Just to go back. So the lens that they're seeing it through where you're going, oh no, I can still remember when with Gore and the hanging chads and Mondale and Gerald Jean Ferraro and now this and that they go, I don't know. I think there's always a cool black guy who's going to be president and it would be surprising if I didn't have an African black. <laughs> so, so the lens that they see things through is, is so we have a lot of convers like vital conversations okay. here, you know, with, and then in the beginning there were protests and then we were going to do a peaceful protest and then curfew came down so and we're all sort of cooped up together discussing this in a circle whereas there i think there are more things that we can do i've always been um uh, an activist for public education mm -hmm. and i think that for 20 years what i think there's real inequities that come up there um mm -hmm. and and you don't have to be even particularly poor or disenfranchised to have a a quote unquote bad school district. In fact, in Los Angeles, unless you're in a $1.5 million home, you know, you won't be in a good school district and what all those things are. So I think, you know, it, it's such a, it's an incredible time so that this is all foregrounded of racial inequity in other, in all ways. And I just hope that this, we can keep the discussion going so that many other issues are dealt with that feed into this as well and yeah. you know and that we can kind of build bonds between each other of some lasting ways to go forward i yeah. don't know if that makes any sense you know it's it's, it's a very reactive time but but hopefully there will we have a long way to go the election to begin with the election i think is terrifying all of us right i mean on the one hand it feels like you know, yesterday, I guess I was reading about the big spikes right in Florida and Texas and Arizona. So people are saying that'll hopefully probably mean Trump will be out. I hope so. I'm so afraid he's going to do some sort of just horrible, scary thing to try and fuck it all up, like not allow us to vote or something. But maybe I'm being paranoid. Oh, give me your advice on this, Sandra. I ordered a bumper sticker the other day that says Trump sucks. And it came, but my boyfriend was like that's kind of moronic and I was like excuse me moronic I mean he doesn't like Trump either but do you think it's childish to have a Trump sucks bumper sticker on your car Nina I thought this would be a softball interview and we would just <laughs> talk about women and see the soap and the Melanie Mayron set the charcoal soap it's kind of like uh uh it's uh you know are you okay do you Am I ask you to have a Trump sucks Trump sucks <laughs> I, I would I would have to take the fifth on that. It's like the one because I deal with teens a lot of time on these questions, and so it's so it's kind of like, uh, you know what, you go girl. Whatever. You go girl. Okay, fine. That's fine. I asked my kids. I just wouldn't be afraid to have my car key scratched. I mean, after you know, I was afraid to, when in the election. I don't know. I'm flashing back to 2015. I was afraid to have a. Hillary bumper sticker on the back of my car because in California everybody's like Bernie, Ber like and you know and I think my car was parked somewhere um, and um, my boyfriend was going seeing was at the VA hospital and when he came out he couldn't find the car because somebody had carefully glued a Trump bumper sticker over my Hillary bumper sticker. Uh, that's a good point. I might get vandalized. I just read the um, last week. I read the Curtis Sittenfeld Rodham book. You know her right. book, which. And do you know what it's about? It imagines that Hillary never married Bill. 
Oh, really fascinating. Good. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I don't think it's the best Curtis Sittenfeld, although I always love her books, but it is, I and mean, I guess I shouldn't spoil it here by telling people what happens because it's just come out in hardcover. But um, for all of us who were so traumatized by the Hillary election, it's, it's satisfying to read because it imagines a totally different, different course of history with Hillary. That sounds fascinating. I'm, no, I'm, I'm totally obsessed with Hillary. And I, I know the Chasing Hillary book was something that I gobbled up because I just kept puzzling over that. And yeah, and in fact, why a fair number of my friends were so, like, girlfriends, Democratic girlfriends, and never. It's like, why so divisive? I mean, that's, that's something I guess I'll puzzle over to my deathbed. I think, yeah, we will. Um, are you reading anything good right now? Uh, I just, okay, so I have been working on this Wendy Wasserstein project, Ooh. so with uh, the New York Stage of Film, we're gonna, and so Wendy Wasserstein, as you know, is a playwright of, um, where she was with the Sisters Rosenzweig, and so the 90s and the early aughts, was one of the first and only playwrights to put in Sisters Rosenzweig a couple of characters that are all 50 and over, women who are 50 and over are the leads of the play. Yeah. And no ingenue. There is no particular men. And I've always been fascinated like that. So when I uh, did the Mad Woman and the Volvo and made that into a play, I had women over 53 of us on stage and they played all the parts, you know, boys, girls, whatever men. Mm -hmm. Like, so I happen to have, uh, Wendy Wasserstein is called Bachelor Girls, it, an essay collection up in my, is in my bedroom. So, um, and it's so interesting to look back in this time of things that have changed, um, you know, and it's light humor of women's magazines, of which we usually have so many and we don't now. Yeah. I mean, or you think of all the magazines that we used to have that we don't have. Um, and it's interesting to look back in time and read some of that. And I also have in that same sort of my bathtub, Carrie Fisher, Surrender the Pink. And Carrie Fisher is somebody who I think I mean, that's as good as she's so witty and so funny that we forget that. It was always like, oh, Princess Leia of Star Wars also writes. Like, here's a dog that can no, also she's struggle. Great. She's, she's so great. good. She's no, so good. Great. She's so good. And actually, I love Wendy Wasserstein. I love all these women. So when you say Wendy Wasserstein and Carrie Fisher, the third person I think of, of course, is Nora Ephron. Does that make sense? Is that what you would yeah. think? I mean, yeah. like, it's like yeah. they all three go together. Um, well, Fran Lebowitz also, although Fran Lebowitz made her career on just two books, which is, we and the rest of us people who are still writing like 30 or 40 years later, how did she do it? Because she's like going to East Hampton and, you know, doing these great things at the 90 Seconds Street event. She just basically wrote two books. They're fantastic. Yeah, she's pretty amazing. I saw a good, did I see it or read it? A good interview with Fran Lebowitz during the pandemic where she was pretty funny and she was in New York and... I can't remember. Anyway, she's great. But okay, that's good to know what you're reading. That's so fun. I like it. Wendy Wasserstein. Yeah, it's a little bit, just because I'm studying it now and just like contemplating how much women's roles have changed. And I think that a big question for her, like with the Heidi Chronicles, et cetera, was for Wendy Wasserstein is kind of like, should I settle down with a man and give up my career? Or can I have both? Maybe I really can't have both. And that particular landscape has, has I think, changed in our time that it, it, you know, there, there are different questions that we, we ask now. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, actually, in the Rodham book, the Curtis Sittenfeld, Hillary doesn't get married or have kids. And it's one of my like slight, not criticisms of the book, but I was a little surprised because it really feels like the message in that book is that you can't do it all. And I do think it's changed, right, for women right now. I mean, there's certainly, since your book, I mean, your book really, I think, was the first one to the Volvo, Mad Woman and the Volvo, to really talk about our generation. And now there's lots of lots of writing about menopause in a slightly different, less, less, you know, fixated on the health aspects, but just kind of our lives as 50, you know, 50 year old, 60 year old women. Yeah, no, I, I hope that will be so because you know, women 45 to 65 are America's largest demographic group. I think there's like 44 million women. Yeah. And it's kind of like not covered in Hollywood. It's J Lo who is 50, who plays a 40 year old, and then you have Jane Fonda at 82 you know, snogging on screen, which is great. But there's a whole bunch of women in the middle who are doing a lot of, th they're holding families together, they're working, they're innovating, they're volunteering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they're changing their communities, you know, or they're, you know, just taking care of a parent, which is its own full-time job. So yeah. um, I think the way these stories can be told, and I think we're 
moving towards less of a woe is me of kind of like, oh, I have kind of the golden girls. I have, although I am wearing a bandana. Yeah, I have three chins that I don't see well, although that's true. But it's also kind of a really joyous time and a hilarious time. And I call it not like a second uh, teenhood, but I say I have the body of an 85 year old and the IRA of a 25 year old. <laughs> uh, but, but I think for me, it's that I can show you my massage chair because the great thing is about not caring anymore. Like, not like caring. I, really want that, I really want that pleather chair and I'm getting it. Right, I, all right, so wait, move aside slowly. You're slightly frozen on my screen, but anyway, behind Sandra is this awesome massage chair that we just published on the Wolfer, a piece of 10 things that Sandra can't live without. Um, and one of them is this fabulous, um, Osaki 2000 massage chair from Costco, which is on sale at 1999. It's a big purchase and she loves it and writes about it really hilariously in the book. Uh, but you're right. I think, I mean, that's the thing we get all the time when we ask women like best thing, worst thing about getting older. It's like, there's a lot of freedom in kind of both the reality, our kids are older, we're just freer. And we also just feel like we don't give a shit as much and it's great. No, I think that's totally true. And oh, my internet connection is unstable. Can that's okay. Now I see your now I see your um you know your official photo. Okay, so I'm <laughs> talking through it. Uh, oh, start my video. Great. Um, and I think part there, and I think part of that is reflected in our relationships too. Because as I as another section of the book is the fantasy of living alone, where one time I had to do a piece for New York magazine about people over 50 living alone and was that terrifying and were they depressed and sad and scared. And I go, I go, that's a great topic and I really need the money. And then I started um, talking to my friends, girlfriends, and the ones who are single loved it. They go, I love my life. It's fantastic. I don't pick up anybody's laundry. I, I go come and go. I take, I'm started taking flying lessons or bang or whatever they were doing of just women. And I think that that's the thing when you're in a midlife relationship, not the man who's looking for a nurse or a purse. There are a lot of like, I, I met this guy on match.com and then he sort of moved in and then I asked him to move out because the men were more needy than the women. And I yeah. think it's because at this age, we know ourselves. And I remember being so obsessed in my twenties of trying to be the cool girlfriend of like, so your boyfriend would say, well, I used to date Nadine and she was uncool, but me and my four male roommates who never shower think you're really cool. And you go, that's it, I'm cool. You know, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't like your music. I don't like the smelly laundry. I don't like the right. laundry soup, but I'm cool. Like, and now you go out of the you go, I'm not cool. And I don't give a shit. That's right. Although you are living with your boyfriend, right? I'm, I'm in that place too, where you start to wonder, maybe, maybe you do want the kind of living apart together relationship and I, I don't know there's a lot more freedom and security that comes with people day. love having the separate love my girlfriends love having the separate places and then they come together when they want to yeah but you're not sharing the bedroom with the collapsing stack of newspapers and the yeah. computer manuals there's definitely something to it probably who knows anyway it's good that we have it's good that we feel more free thank you so much for doing this I just adore you I really do um so everyone should order Sandra's book the Mad Woman in the Roomba, and it's super funny. And we're going to publish this piece on her 10 favorite things this week, which will also make you laugh. Oh, and, and the goddess pants that I mentioned, this is what they look like. Okay, these are fantastic. I would be wearing them now. The last waistband. Hilariously, I would be wearing mine, except my daughter Ella took them. They're super comfy. So they're Asana's <laughs> goddess pants. <laughs> Yeah, and they're really, yeah, they're super comfy and I can, I can send you some or hook you up with the lady. They're just, for the pandemic, if you've lost your waistline, that's the thing that I talk about in there. Yeah, and there, we'll put them, we'll, we're, we've linked them in the article so people can right. check them out on there. Right. And um, I just wish you lots of luck promoting the book and getting through this time. And I hope I see you in real life again soon. Yes, and I love the Wolfer. Thank you for doing that. It's such a great community. So needed and so fun. Thank and you, sweetie. All right, take care. Have a good rest of your day.